Breaking overnight, a 2022 Daher TBM 960 aircraft went down at the Truckee Airport while attempting an instrument approach in icing conditions with the weather below minimums. The accident occurred on the missed approach portion of the instrument approach procedure. Here's what we know so far. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. It's Sunday, the 31st of March. Starting with the Aviation Safety Network, Saturday, 30 March, 2024, Sokata TBM 700N 960, Avram Enterprises LLC is the owner operator, tail number November 960 Lima Papa, a 2022 model of aircraft, two fatalities, two occupants on board. The aircraft departed Denver Centennial Airport and was attempting to return home to their home airport here at Truckee, California, where this aircraft is apparently based. A Dahar TBM 700 airplane was destroyed when it was involved in an accident near the Truckee Airport, two fatalities at this point. It appears the aircraft was executing the go-around missed approach for runway 20 following the use of the RNAV GPS approach via the waypoint Woodpa. We'll look at that in a moment. This is the same instrument approach that took that led the crew of a Challenger jet um, into a series of pilot errors that led to a stall crash situation in Truckee a couple of years ago. This is a very tricky mountain instrument approach, especially in low visibility conditions. The ADSB track data shows the aircraft stopped its descent at 6,500 feet, approximately a half mile to the north of the airport, which is the uh, LP, that's localizer, performance MDA minimum altitude. The aircraft appears to then climb to an altitude of only 7,200 feet while making a 180 degree turn overhead the airport to a bearing of 010, which is the missed approach procedure, the published missed approach procedure, followed shortly by a left hand stalling spiral into the crash location at nearly 11,000 feet per minute. Let's look at the data here at Flight Radar 24. The flight departed Denver's Centennial Airport and was attempting to return to the Truckee Airport. A total flight time of just over three hours, about three hours and 15 minutes. A quick look at the graph data from FlightAware 24 indicates to me that the aircraft was on autopilot throughout most, if not all, of this flight. Looking over here on the ADSB exchange, they're reporting that nav modes at the time of the accident that were being used by the aircraft were autopilot on, vertical nav, approach, and lateral nav. The Truckee Airport is located here in the High Sierra, just north of Lake Tahoe, in the Martis Valley at about the 6,000 foot elevation. The accident aircraft was found on the railroad tracks next to Glenshire Drive and Olympic Boulevard, just north of the airport. The Truckee Airport Martis Valley is surrounded by much higher terrain. Weather at the time of the accident was reported calm winds, one half statute mile of visibility, snowing, overcast at 900, temperature minus 01 Celsius, both temperature and dew point minus 01. If we look at the last couple of data points on FlightAware, we see the aircraft descending on autopilot on the instrument approach down to a uh, Minimum altitude of 6,475 feet, which is very close to the minimum altitude for the instrument approach, which we'll look at in a minute, and then begin a missed approach, climbing to about 7,000 feet and starting the right-hand turn to the north with the last data point here on FlightAware being 7,175 feet, climbing at 1,000 feet per minute and 167 miles per hour ground speed. If we zoom in on the data here on the flight radar 24, we can see a fairly stabilized approach, though rather high ground speed coming into the RNAV on runway 20, about 800 feet per minute, rate of descent, 123 knots, 120 knots, 110 knots. Starting the missed approach, climbing 7,000 feet, well, Descending 320 feet per minute right there. Descending 1,100 feet per minute at 7,000 feet. This is on the right-hand missed approach going right over the uh, runway at Truckee. 6,900 feet minus 1,800 feet per minute. 154 knots ground speed. Minus 1,000 feet per minute. 
gets it leveled off, starts a climb at 320 feet per minute, 155 knots ground speed, still only 6,900 feet, 832 foot per minute rate of climb, 1,500 foot per minute rate of climb, still right around 7,000 feet, 2,300 foot per minute rate of climb, 144 knots, 1,300 foot per minute rate of climb, 147 knots. Now we lose control of the aircraft, minus nearly 5,000 feet per minute at 154 knots ground speed. And there's nearly 11,000 feet per minute down at 140 knots. Last data point. Here's the instrument approach for the RNAV GPS runway 20 at Truckee. First off, Truckee's tower is open only certain hours of the day and closes very near to the time of this accident. This accident occurred about 7 p.m. last night, just before sunset, and just right around the time the tower was open or closed. So investigators will find out pretty quick whether the tower was open or closed. They'll get any and all the ATC tapes that they can get. It appears that the pilot was attempting the LPMDA approach. That's this localizer performance MDA, which brings you down to 6,480 feet. Regardless of which category you're in, A, B, C, or D, now the TBM should be able to be a category A or B aircraft based on its V ref, but the pilot was flying very high speeds, putting him up in the category C or better. Regardless, the minimums for this approach is one mile visibility and uh, the weather at the time was one half mile visibility. So this is something you can do in FAR part 91. It's assumed that this was an FAR part 91 flight is that you are allowed to take a peek or you are allowed to attempt an instrument approach, even though the weather is below minimums for that instrument approach. This is something that cannot be done in the FAR part 121 airline world. So as we learned from the Challenger crash, there's a lot of gotchas on this approach. It's localizer performance is basically a non-precision approach. It's gonna bring you down to a dive or drive sort of condition. And the visual descent point located right here, just seven tenths of a mile from Winub, is gonna put you pretty high to complete the final approach and landing on runway 20. It's gonna put you at a three and a half degree visual glide slope angle. To add to the complexity of this, near sunset, the VASI for runway 20 was notumed closed. So you don't have the lights of the visual approach lights to assist you for the landing on runway 20. Now, if you wanna circle out of this approach and land on some of the other runways, well, there's a lot of restrictions on that as well. Circling up here in the upper left corner, circling to runway 211 and 29, not approved at night. Well, this was right at sunset circling not approved for category c remember he's flying high higher speeds than than uh, the aircraft is capable of possibly because of the icing conditions circling not authorized for category c south of runway 29 and east of runway 20. another fine print item when local altimeter settings not received the entire procedure is not authorized and another thing this this approach brings you in at an angle to runway 20. You're coming in on a 182 inbound course to runway 20 and you'll, you will be dropped off just left of the runway as was found in his tracks. And here in the upper right, we see the missed approach, the published missed approach procedure, which it looks like he was flying exactly. Missed approach, do not exceed 200 knots until Groit. The idea is to do a climbing right hand turn to Groit. Climb right turn to 12,000 feet, direct Groit, and, and track 016 to Owega and hold. And that's about where the crash occurred, was on the right-hand turn portion of the missed approach. If we take the KML data from the ADSB data and transpose it here onto Google Earth, we can get a good picture of this flight path. So here he is on autopilot, flying the RNAV 20 approach, and it brings you in just as the instrument approach procedure explains to the left of runway 20 and off at a bit of an angle and then he commences 
the missed approach procedure as published and then loses control of the aircraft right here, crashing onto the railroad tracks. If we look at this in 3D, and tilt this down, we can see the aircraft just barely beginning to climb, not climbing much at all during this entire missed approach procedure, which brings up another point. If he's using the localizer performance MDA with this asterisk, you're taking it down to 6,480 feet. You're down pretty deep in the hole, and that missed approach requires a minimum climb of 270 feet per nautical mile to 7,700 feet. So you got to climb up and out of that valley quickly. But looking at this Google Earth data, ADSB data, it appears that this was a situation of a loss of aircraft control and not a case of sea fit or controlled flight into terrain. Now if we spin the heading around a little bit. It's important that the aircraft climb quickly and out to the right because of the higher terrain located just south of the airport. So here we are south of the airport looking to the north where he starts his 180 degree turn to the north and then losing control of the aircraft somewhere right about in here. If we look at this aircraft's flight history out of Truckee, it has been flying a lot out of the Truckee airport. So a lot of recency of experience, which investigators are gonna to need to find out, was this all just private flying by the owner or is this aircraft on some sort of a leaseback? Is it being chartered out? Is it being flown by other pilots? Or were all these flights flown by the pilot that was involved in the accident? That's a lot of flying and a lot of recency of flying experience. The aircraft involved in the accident was this 2022 TBM 960. This is one of the latest model design aircraft, single engine turboprop aircraft using the PT-6A engine and is very well equipped for single pilot IFR operations, some of the most demanding flying out there in aviation today. Looking at the leading edge of the aircraft, you can see the anti-icing and de-icing capability of this aircraft. This aircraft is equipped with de-ice boots, so it can fly into known icing conditions. However, these aircraft are not to be flown in severe icing conditions. There's an airworthiness directive that prevents these aircraft from flying into severe icing conditions. The problem is turboprop aircraft are generally subjected to heavier icing conditions than many other types of aircraft. If you get a pie rep from an airliner type aircraft about icing, they might report moderate or light icing, whereas for that same turbo or for a turboprop aircraft that same icing may quickly develop into severe icing and the kind of weather conditions we had here yesterday could have easily developed into severe icing conditions the problem with severe icing conditions on these aircraft is that the icing conditions can simply overwhelm the anti-icing and de-icing capability of the aircraft and also in this airworthiness directive, it is advised that if you get into severe icing conditions where icing is forming behind the boots of the aircraft, you are to turn the autopilot off. The big problem with getting caught in icing conditions with the autopilot on is the autopilot can mask the conditions, the flying characteristics of the aircraft as the ice continues to accumulate on the aircraft faster than the anti-icing and de-icing systems can remove it the aerodynamic characteristics of the aircraft begin to change and the autopilot will continue to fight that until which point the autopilot can no longer handle the out of trim condition and the autopilot will suddenly disconnect from the aircraft and it's quite easy or quite possible that to get the aircraft into a stalled condition at a very high airspeed in icing conditions because that's one of the first things icing conditions does is raises your stall speed increases your stall speed and or you can get into a stall of the tail of the aircraft as well now this is one of the neat features i've found in this particular aircraft is it does have an automatic de-icing system and this is one of the great things about this design is it's made a lot of things very automatic to ease the pilot workload in these sort of conditions including an automatic de-icing 
system on board the aircraft, which will effectively turn on all your anti-icing and de-icing equipment if, in the event, the pilot forgets to, because he may very well be overloaded with all the things he has to deal with as a single pilot flying in IFR conditions. This aircraft also comes complete with all the very latest Garmin 3000 series of avionics to help you deal with instrument flying conditions. But the weather conditions out of Truckee yesterday were very conducive to icing conditions and potential severe icing conditions with this low pressure area located just off the coast pumping in moisture, cold moisture from the north coming around and wrapping up and spilling moisture and icing right over the Truckee Airport area in the High Sierra. Here's a copy of that Airworthiness Directive 980422 and it's just a great reminder for all of us about the hazards of flying in icing conditions even with an aircraft that is capable of flying in icing conditions. During severe icing conditions that exceed those for which the airplane is certified shall be determined by the following visual cues. Accumulation of ice on the upper surface of the wing after the protected area. Unusually extensive ice accumulation on the airframe and windshield in areas that are not normally observed to collect ice. Since the autopilot when installed and operating may mask the tactile cues that indicate adverse changes in the handling characteristics, use of the autopilot is prohibited when any of the visual cues specified above exist or when unusual lateral trim requirements or autopilot trim warnings are encountered while the airplane is in icing conditions. So they say if you get into severe icing conditions, if the autopilot is engaged, hold the control wheel firmly and disengage the autopilot. And then you need to get out of the icing conditions. You shouldn't even be getting yourself into these icing conditions, but it'll be up to investigators to determine what sort of information the pilot had at the time before he attempted this instrument approach into Truckee, California. And investigators will be looking for the perishable evidence of icing, airframe icing on the aircraft. If first responders got any pictures of the airframe shortly after it crashed, that could be a great help for investigators to help determine if this icing was a contributing factor to the crash or if this was simply a loss of control of the aircraft while flying the missed approach. Thank you so much for your support of this channel, especially the folks over on Patreon that make this content possible. See you here.